What is deconstruction? Deconstruction is a form of textual analysis associated mainly with the French philosopher Jacques Derrida, the American critic Paul de Man, and his fellow Yale deconstructionists, Harold Bloom, Jeffrey Hartman, and J. Hillis Miller. One of the principal strands in post-structuralism, deconstruction, has had an immense influence on literary studies, though this is more marked in the English-speaking world than in France, philosophy, and historiography. Thanks in part to Derrida's translator, Goyatra Chakravoti Spivak, it has had a major impact upon postcolonial theory. It has also become an important element in queer theory. Although the practitioners of deconstruction insist that it is not a theory or philosophy that can be applied, or even one that can be defined in a set of propositions, a number of general principles can be identified. All forms of deconstruction rely upon extremely close readings of the texts under analysis and tend to refrain from introducing external evaluative criteria. To this extent, deconstruction can be seen as an extreme form of imminent critique. Indeed, Demand argues, in terms reminiscent of the new criticism's veneration of the autonomy of the verbal icon, that deconstruction is not something that is added to the text. A literary text deconstructs itself because it simultaneously asserts and denies the authority of its own rhetoric. Little or no distinction is made between genres, philosophical texts are to be analysed in the same terms as literary texts, and one of the sated goals of deconstruction is to undermine philosophy's prestige by showing that it too is a rhetorical construct. In strictly philosophical terms, Deconstruction's ancestry can be traced to Friedrich Nietzsche and his contention that there are no facts, only interpretations, and to Madden Heidegger's critique of the priority that is traditionally given to the present tense in attempts to discuss the nature of being. One of Derrida's constant concern is with the metaphysics of presence, which he regards as central to the history of Western philosophy, or the thesis that the subject can be self-understanding and can express itself fully in speech. In his earliest work, he makes a far-reaching critique of what he calls logocentrism or phonocentrism, which assumes that speech exists prior to writing and which is typified by the biblical in the beginning was the word. By claiming that speech is the primal and full form of expression, logocentrism inevitably ignores or conceals the fact that, if writing is a supplement to speech, a theme that can be easily traced from Plato to Ferdinand Saussure, something must be absent in the speech that has to be supplemented. Speech then does not have a point of origin, but arises from an ordinary lack. Derrida follows Saussure in describing language as a series of supplements and substitutions, but argues that the theory of the sign, a self-sufficient union of signifier and signified, is itself an instance of logocentrism. In his critique of the sign, Derrida introduces the crucial notion of difference, meaning both difference and deferral, to demonstrate that language and meaning have no point of origin and no end. The meaning is always the product of the difference between signs, and it is always deferred by a temporal structural that never comes to an end. There is, moreover, no final or correct reading of a text. In fact, any reading generates a supplementary reading. The effect of this emphasis on a never-ending process of difference is to unsettle the binary oppositions that are so important to structuralism, the most elementary being that between differential phonemes, such as F and P, by demonstrating both that one element, male as opposed to female, white as opposed to black, is always dominant and that they are inherently unstable because the implicit hierarchy can, in principle, be inverted. The universalist ambition of structuralism is also challenged by deconstruction's emphasis on undecidable aporias which cannot be described in terms of sets of binary oppositions, such as Plato's pharmacon, meaning both poison and antidote. This is in fact the subject of one of Derrida's most brilliant essays. Derrida's detailed reading of Saussurean, of grammatology, exemplifies deconstruction's insistence on unraveling the logic 
and contradictions of the text itself. In one of his most lucid statements of principle, Derrida explains that deconstructing a philosophical text means working through its concepts and logic in such a way as to discover and determine what it cannot describe, what its history has excluded in order to constitute it as what it is. De Man makes a similar point when he argues that, if they are to be coherent and self-consistent, literary texts must of necessity be blind to the metaphors and other figures of rhetoric that constitute them as texts. Deconstruction's rigorous examination of those figures reveals the weakness of the links that hold them together. Although deconstruction has become an extraordinarily, and somewhat bewilderingly, sophisticated exercise in reading, Derrida's early review of Michel Foucault's first major book, Madness and Civilization, A History of Insanity in the Age of Reason, illustrates many of its principles and some of the difficulties inherent in it. Foucault claims to be both writing the archaeology of the silence surrounding madness and the gesture that divorced reason from unreason by literally confining the mad in the asylums of 17th century France. Derrida contends that Foucault has confused a singular event with the category of reason as such and has misconstrued the meaning of the great confinement of the insane. Reason constitutes itself by expelling madness from the definition of subjectivity. The exclusion of madness is therefore not an event, but a precondition for the definition of reason. The categories of reason and madness are not mutually exclusive. A concept of madness is part of the constitutive definition of reason. Foucault's book inadvertently or blindly reproduces the structures that exclude madness. To attempt to write the archaeology of a silence is to breach that silence, to repeat the violence perpetrated against the insane. Thus, Foucault's book is itself a gesture of confinement, a Cartesian gesture for the 20th century. It is Cartesian in that classical reason's definition of madness derives from the certainty of not being mad. That certainty is founded upon the cogito, and the whole thrust of deconstruction is to undermine such certainties. Gianni Vatimo, who is by no means unsympathetic to deconstruction, remarks that it often resembles a form of virtuoso performance art, and a common criticism is that the authority of the virtuoso is the one thing that is unchallenged. Frank Lentrichia, for instance, has commented unfavorably on the apparently unassailable authority and certainty displayed by de Man. In his belated reply to Derrida's criticisms of his madness and civilization, Foucault makes the more damning criticism that deconstruction gives the master a limitless sovereignty and simply teaches students to repeat and reproduce his words. 